for the wonderful introduction. So thanks for the wonderful introdu introduction. That's really very kind. And thank you very much for having me be part of this seminar. I can only uh, re-emphasize what you just said, Rafa. This is a wonderful seminar series and uh, you know, really interesting papers to be being presented all the time. I'm not sure that that's the most interesting one here, but I'll try to make it interesting today. Um, it's joint work with Tao Yun He was also here. And uh, let me uh, let me share my screen to get going on this. Okay, so here we are. Okay, uh, and if they are in, in if, if they are clarifying questions in between, by all means, throw them in. Um, but you know, I'm I'm very much looking forward to the discussion by Martin. Very grateful to him that he's willing to do this. So the title of the paper is "Parallel Digital Currencies." Um, Okay, Zoom here. I can see the full screen already. I think. Can can you can you can you still see me and hear me? So it said Zoom crashed on my end. Everything is perfect. Uh, I can see. I mean, I can see the slides. I can see the mouse moving, and I can hear you. Uh, I cannot okay. see your your picture. I, I can see how. Yeah. Okay, so we got. Harold, are you still there? Yeah, I'm. I'm back again. Okay. I, so I it, it just said Zoom crashed. I have no idea why. We lost the, um, the slides. Okay. The slides are also gone. So let me let me restart this here. Um, okay. Yeah. So I, perfect. So I I hope you'll be fine this time. Um, you know this this is one of the you know charms of doing um, these online presentations. Okay. So it's joint work with Chao Yun. And we call it parallel digital currencies and security prices, but in many ways, um, you know, you could take out the word digital here. You, as you're going to see, there's nothing particularly digital in this paper, but we do think that the issues that we talk about, and we actually think you'll change the title of the paper as a result. But as you're going to see, as we're going to argue, the issues that arise here, you know, they have arisen maybe in other countries before, you know, with parallel currencies too, but in the future, these issues will be much more salient. Um, also in, you know, in, in highly developed countries and with the digital currencies, I think it's gonna, you know, be more salient and that's why we had the digital there. So that's, that, that was our motivation at least. And, uh, and, and so it's a bit of a forward looking paper in that sense. And there's increasing variety of privately issued digital currencies now alongside the official currencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, ADA, stable coins, what have you. Some companies have started accepting cryptocurrencies and uh, some companies like Tesla flip-flop back and forth whether they accept Bitcoin or not and so forth. So this is all getting so sorted out. Um, central bank digital currencies come online, right? And maybe central bank digital currencies will be easy to use in other countries as well. So you also uh, might see possibly um, you know, the e-dollar being used more in Europe or vice versa. Uh, DM is, is another one that uh, may come to pass, right? So once DM is introduced and everybody is um, is using it Facebook, I mean, the version of Facebook right now, it's the version of DM right now, it's going to be tied to the dollar. So it would be version of an e-dollar uh, circulating elsewhere, but you could imagine other versions where they go back to the original concept where it's, uh, you know, introducing additional versions perhaps where it's, backed by uh, you know, several currencies or bonds or some other concepts out there. Technology is simple. And so once the technology is that simple, you would imagine that this is going to go to go broader than it already has. Okay. Now, um, money has a couple of roles, right? So these are currencies, these are monies. And uh, traditionally we emphasize three roles. We emphasize that it's a store value. It's not a very good store value typically. So we say, well, you're much better off investing in bonds. So let me take store of the value off the table here. But then money serves as a medium of exchange and as a unit of account. I've written a couple of papers that focus on the medium of exchange issues that arise with cryptocurrencies. So this paper here is strictly about the unit of account role of monies. And uh, more precisely, we ask what happens when firms price in these currencies rather than official currency. Now you might say that that's a little silly, you know. It's, but I mean, look forward, right? I mean, that's that's what we wanting to do. In fact, 
you know, maybe that's a little coy, but nonetheless, there is a firm already that's pricing one of these currencies rather than the official uh, currency, and that's Ethereum. So if you're on, a, if you if you try to run off these one of these smart contracts on Ethereum, what you have to pay for is gas, and gas is priced in ether. It's not priced in dollar. Um, no, the prices aren't particularly sticky there if you check, but never mind. <laughs> Less pricing there definitely is in ether. You could say, of course, you know what. What else would you expect? It's on the Ethereum blockchain. But I mean, maybe that's one of the impetuses how the pricing in these cryptocurrencies or other currencies could arise. Okay, so that's a question that we asked. Maybe it's never going to come to pass, but we better think about the future in particular when you think about central banks and so forth being faced with these rising digital currencies. And that's what we do in this paper. What we do is we take a new Keynesian model with you know, one closed economy with multiple currencies. So we have had the multi-currency, multi-country, multi-currency models before. Here it's a single country with multiple currencies. So that's a distinction. And what then immediately uh, comes up, and that's going to be the central part of the talk in many ways, is how do you formulate the Taylor rule for monetary policy? Um, should you target all sectors or should you target only the dollar sector? Well, that's a decision. Um, should you target aggregate price inflation or only dollar inflation? So these are the these are the two two possibilities, and there's a you know um, there there I guess there are uh, four combinations here in principle, and we're going we're going through them, and I'll show you how that makes a difference. Okay, so <clears throat> now the first thing is this year, and this year is really um, Carrick and Wallace. So I should give all the credit to them, but it's a result that, I don't know, we should be aware of them. Um, and then the stochastic version of this here is Manuel Peck. And um, let's see, I just, uh, okay, sorry about this. Um, and we kind of rediscovered that, if you like, in my paper with, uh, uh, on some simple Bitcoin economics and chilling ULIC. So it's always... You know, so the moment you have two different monies, there's an exchange rate indeterminacy. And in the stochastic version of this model, it manifests itself that exchange rates become random walks. And, and, and there can be these exchange rate shocks that arise without any other source of uncertainties. Now, you could argue that that's not the case for a stable coin and so forth, but that's, that's going to be the key new shock here, if you like, compared to a standard New Keynesian model that we're going to emphasize and analyze. And with that, the relative price between the sectors becomes a state variable that introduces rich sectoral dynamics. That's also not part of some of the other you know, recent uh, New Keynesian papers out there for other reasons, but here it comes due to the exchange rate shocks. And then we get the, we get these results, right? You can think through, okay, what's a dollar? What does a dollar depreciation do? Let's say, right? You could also it's going to the linearize. So you can flip the sign and it's an appreciation. Okay, so we're going to get reallocation between sectors. Maybe that's not surprising. Uh, we get, uh, depending on what monetary policy does, we get a, a short and temporary aggregate recession, but um, we get a more persistent recession if the monetary policy only reacts to dollar inflation. So the, um, so the nature of monetary policy is really important here. And then, you know, that gets mitigated by flexibility of prices, changes, and depending on the size of the sector and so forth. Um, you know, in the paper, we also go into the endogenous currency choice, but that's a, that's a different dynamics altogether. So let me, and there's, there's some issue that we need to fix there anyway. So let me, let me not dwell on that one. Okay, here's some literature. Allow me to skip the literature in the interest of time. This is, except for this here, this, uh, you know, I want to make a plug for him. Uh, Nicolas castro Cien Fuego is a PhD student from the University of Chicago who did these sectoral shocks and, uh, and had a new Keynesian model of sectoral shocks. And so the dynamics there is somewhat similar to the dynamics here. And uh, you know, I, I, mean, I wish him all kinds of success in getting this paper published, let's just put it that way. Okay, so um, here's the model and it's probably, um, you know, for this short presentation, maybe written down a little richer than is really needed. Um, at the end of the day, you know, it's enough to just think of a dollar sector and one sector that's priced in a different currency. It's written down in general form here because we have these general formulas and the general formulas are really cool. So it's, it's kind of better to start with the general version. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's enough to just think of one parallel currency for the, for the dynamic results that we have. 
Okay, so there's one currency, that's the official currency of, the, you know, that the central bank has under control. So let's think of that as the dollar. And then these parallel currencies, and, you know, I'm going to talk about it as if this is Bitcoin, but of course it could be ADA, it could be Ethereum, it could be the E-Euro, it could be the E-1, you know, so something else that's also being used in that country as a means of payment. So thus, there's going to be a price of currency J in dollars. So for these cryptocurrencies, we talk about the price, but really it's an exchange rate, right? Now, the exchange rate of the dollar for itself is just one, and then you can also get to the relative exchange rates of different currencies to each other. You fix, you know, in this, in the, for most part of the paper, you fix a set of firms that prices in currency J. Um, you know, I mean, that's a, you know, it's, it's not different than the typical assumption you came to models that, that firms fix prices, right? And so, but here they have to choose it. Here they, they, they pick a currency and that's where, that's where much of the action comes from. And you could also think through a model where firms fix price into different prices, but then you have to talk about, you know, how easy is it is to exchange monies and so forth. That will be a different paper and we're not doing this here. So, um, so there's a measure of firms, uh, VJT, think half, right? I mean, half in dollar, half in Bitcoin, the prices in currency J, and then you can construct the usual things. You can construct uh, the sector price index, the general price index, the general price inflation, and finally the sectoral relative price, right? And so you can look at the, the you can convert the price level in, that's in Bitcoin, let's say the PJT would be the price level in Bitcoin, convert it to dollar. That would be the dollar equivalent of the price level in the Bitcoin sector and divided by, divided by the general price index. And that would be you the, giving you the, the, the Bitcoin sector price, relative price level. And like that, there's now a dollar relative price level because the PT here, the PT that's in the denominator aggregates across all these sectors. Okay. So here's a picture of this, right? You have a dollar sector, Bitcoin sector, it could be an Ethereum sector, a DM sector, and so forth. Um, and this extension here, you know, I'm not going to talk about for, uh, for today. All right, the rest is very standard. I, I just threw up these slides. I mean, there's nothing surprising here, but you know, just for the sake of completeness, I want to go through this, right? There's lifetime utility, people like consumption and, uh, and liquidity, if you want to pick, uh, put money in the utility function here and labor supply, they dislike labor supply, I suppose. They have this consumption bundle that's just uh, C as aggregated as usual, the budget constraints, there will be bonds in, um, you know, the, the exchanging money is no issue, so you might as well just um, stick to dollar denominated bonds. If, if you had some friction in the exchanging monies, you know, that would be an issue, and, uh, and that's it. And liquidity is just the sum of all the individual liquidities measured in dollars. You have to convert the monies into dollar here. Firms, very standard, Cobb Douglas, they, uh, you know, you get the Calvo um, ferry, you know, allowing you to reprice every theta j, uh, you know, with, with probably um, one minus theta j, you can reprice with probably theta j, you have to keep to the current price. But the stickiness may depend on the sector, right? So uh, Ethereum reprices its its gas, I think, you know, on, a, on, a, on probably less than a second basis or something. So that's probably very flexible, whereas the dollar sectors may be more, uh, more rigid. So it, it's probably reasonable to think that once we have that, that th these could be different and heterogeneous and uh, that, that throws up other difficulties. Usual firm maximization problem subject to demand. I think the one thing that I want to emphasize about demand here is that demand comes from aggregate output, right? It's not, it's not the... It's not the um, the currency specific output that matters for demand, but overall demand as it, you know, and that just comes from the utility specification. Okay. So then we take that model. Um, I mean, it's, it's basically very standard New Keynes model, except that we have these multiple currencies and we linearize. And when you linearize, you get this equation for exchange rates and exchange rates, you know, have to satisfy this equation. And in fact, um, it, you know, there's, there's no reason to think that that's predetermined here or, you know, depending on something else. So an exchange rate shock arises, right? If you look at, um, I mean, this is, this is between any pair of currencies, but maybe the easier way to write this is if you look at the exchange rate relative to the dollar for currency J, it's going to be the exchange rate this period 
plus an epsilon T shock, right? And so now, of course, um, if one currency rises, that means the other currency has to fall. So dollar appreciation, dollar depreciation is Bitcoin appreciation, but there's this exchange rate shock that, uh, that moves these currencies. Okay. All right, so that's the, in some ways, that's a, that's, a, that's a key new ingredient, right? That we have these, you know, maybe you call them Carrick and Wallace, Manuelli Peck exchange rate shocks in here that arise from this uh, currency indeterminacy, right? I mean, my, at the end of the day, you only need a certain quantity of money and how you split this across the currencies is indeterminate because these are, you know, so, so you could shift this in a random fashion at any moment in time. It has to be unpredictable. Right, and so the oops, this should be plus one here. So the condition expectation of these exchange rate shocks, of course, are equal to zero. Okay. All right, uh, and then the rest is you know conventional. Well, not quite. I mean, you have a sector on New Keynesian Phillips curve. Okay, so the inflation sector J is this beta times expectation of inflation sector J plus C plus one. You have that the output gap, but here, okay, so that's the thing that I emphasized on the previous slide. It's the overall output gap, right? It's the output gap of the overall economy because that determines aggregate demand. It's not the output gap in, the, in sector J. And then also you have these relative prices, right? And so if the dollar depreciates, right? Then you have a relative price relative to the overall price level. And that also matters for inflation as firms may then say, oh, you know, we are much too cheap compared to the other firms. That's maybe to catch up or to slow down or whatever they want to do. And so thus you have this evolution of the relative price level. And that also shows up in some of the other new Keynesian models now that, that feature several sectors, where the relative price level is moving. Dynamic IS equation, just standard. This here is of course aggregate inflation now, which is, a, which is an average about the individual inflations. Okay, so this is now the entire system. And it's, it's fairly rich, right? So I like to show this because you're having these weights, right? And these here are vectors, right? These are the sector individual inflations. This is the vector of relative prices. And they show up in the system and you have to keep track of how this vector of relative prices evolve. So the three equation, new Keynes model now becomes a four equation model where you need vectors rather than individuals. Okay, now we go through some, some theoretical results. Let me skip them in the interest of time. And let me just go ahead directly to the Taylor rules and then go through some, some uh, pictures here to, sh to show what happens. Okay. When you think about the monetary policy, and that's that the paper spent a lot of time and effort, you know, thinking that through, uh, what should the Taylor rule focus on? Should it only, you know, should it focus on aggregate inflation, which is the inflation in dollar and in Bitcoin? I don't think the Fed is currently do this. Um, you know, and it, it might look funny if they if they decided to do this. Um, and and so you might say, no, you know, what the central bank maybe wants to do is just focus on inflation only in the dollar sector. So those are the cases here. But there's a choice to be made. And in particular, if the, as, if, if, the, if more and more firms price in a particular digital currency, that's not the dollar, maybe the first choice is better here. So this is aggregate inflation. Whereas this is dollar inflation here, dollar inflation. Okay. And likewise with output, right? You could, you could focus on aggregate output, but if you think that all the Bitcoin are only sp spent on illicit goods, maybe stabilizing the criminal sector is not of your foremost interest, right? And maybe you just want to focus on the, on the dollar sector here. So, there's, um, so this year is focusing on aggregate output. This is also focusing on aggregate output, but now just dollar inflation. And this is uh, dollar output. Suppose there's a first choice. There's another choice here, which is aggregate inflation, dollar output, which we, which it, which we didn't include in the comparison. So we only have these three versions of Taylor rules. This is going to be our benchmark, and then then we also look at these things. Here are some parameters. Um, we made the stickiness in both sectors the same. Um, you know, for the benchmark again, we have uh, we have you know we, we vary this in the various exercises that we do. We have the size of the non-dollar sector being 0.2, so it's asymmetric in that sense. The dollar sector is smaller. The non-dollar sector, the Bitcoin sector, is smaller, but certainly arguably much larger than it currently is. Okay, and then we need the standard deviation of the exchange rate shock 
it, you know, but it's, it doesn't matter for the impulse responses. Okay, so here now impulse responses. So let me show them to you. So this is the baseline policy where monetary policy, the Taylor rule fo focuses on aggregate inflation, aggregate output. <coughs> uh, and um, okay, and we want to look at a dollar depreciation. So there's suddenly one of these Carrick and Wallace um, manually pay exchange rate shocks and it moves, uh, it moves the, uh, the dollar down relative to Bitcoin. Uh, now the exchange rate is not on this picture. Uh, instead, what's on this picture is the relative price. But, and of course, with the sticky price, the first thing that happens when the, um, when the dollar moves down is that the relative price of Bitcoin goods, you know, is, they're becoming relatively expensive, right? There's one relative price and the price of the Bitcoin goods or the, you know, crypto goods, if you like, in terms of the dollar goods. So the dollar depreciates, these other goods become expensive, but because they're expensive, right? I mean, you can, you know, the, 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 the dollar guys will say, oh, we want to catch up to the, to the other sector and the, and the crypto guys hey, are saying, hey, we want to catch up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got a question. So, so it's like the usual thing here, right? Where the, the uh, you assume the central bank's got the power to just set the, the this this nominal interest rate well, yeah yeah now what about what if you have all the other bonds you know the nominal payoffs and in terms of all the other currencies are those things all determined now or uh yeah i mean to the i mean i mean we having uh, i mean you know all the other nominal bonds i mean exchange rates you know i mean we think of that as being able to freely right the monetary side to this so the soul model as a standard in the New Keynesian world almost doesn't matter, right? But you can you can write it down, right? You can plug it back in and say, okay, what happens in the exchange rate markets? Could you have bonds and so forth? And we're allowing all those. And uh, and indeed, you're completely right that we're assuming that the central bank here can fix a nominal interest rate on the short-term dollar-denominated bonds. And they do this uh, by somehow manipulating this money demand function, which admittedly here is a little trickier, right? Because after all, the money demand now depends on total liquidity. So there is a, so, you know, I'm, I'm, let me sweep that under the rug for now. It's worth a thought, right? Because normally we say, oh, that's, you know, one and the same thing, but not quite, right? Because this is other liquidity that's also part of the money demand, right? And, but this is, yeah, this is standard New Keynes in that sense. Um, no, thank you. So the central bank, that's a central bank tool. It's a nominal interest rate of the dollar denominated bonds, right? They're not fixing the exchange rate for the other bonds here, but just uh, the interest rate on the other bonds. Okay, what do you get? Well, you get a very temporary output gap here in total output, right? But if you look at the individual sectors, of course, the dollar sector will, will produce a lot more because they're relatively cheap. And the non-dollar sector will have a recession because their goods are relatively expensive. And then they're catching up and you see this in this real interest rate, relative price dynamics here. And the way this happens is you're gonna have inflation in the dollar sector um, and you're gonna have you know, deflation is, you know, I mean, in terms of the Bitcoin price in the non-dollar sector, it's some shape in the, in the dollar sector. And you know, that, takes, that takes me longer to try to wrap my mind around this. Let me, let me skip on this one here. Now you could change the policy rules right? We could change the policy rules. So these are the other three policy rules here that we're looking at, uh, you know, where it's, uh, the, the green is, the blue is our benchmark that I just showed you. And you have the dollar um, inflation aggregate output that's green and the dollar inflation dollar output. And it changes the picture, right? I mean, again, you have this relative price, that's pretty much the same throughout, right? But the output gap for these other monetary policy rules now becomes persistent. And that's because you know the central bank only uh, you know focuses on the on the dollar inflation. Maybe you should put on. Maybe you should also do the fourth version, the fourth variant here. But it's it's becoming maybe then a bit much. It's interesting that the inflation in the dollar, you know, that that's different, right? Because and you can see why, right? So the and previously the inflation in the dollar was high. Why? Because the the dollar sector had to catch up to the price in the Bitcoin sector. But now if you have a central bank that focuses on dollar inflation only, they don't like that, right? And, and, uh, and so they're going to stop that debt in the tracks. They're still raising nominal interest rates. Why are they raising nominal interest rates? Well, because you have output exploding in the economy, right? You're having 
you're having lots of extra output, so they're going to step uh, step up to the plate, even though they, and and thereby, you know, I mean, that's sort of this mechanics here. That's that's at least my logic here in thinking this through. Even though they get a negative output gap, you get a boom, and and with that, they step on the brakes for the dollar inflation. So dollar inflation is actually negative here. It's actually negative. So you're getting deflation both in the dollar as well as the non-dollar sector here as a result, and at least for our parameterization. Harold, okay. yeah. just the three minutes. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, very good. So I'm, I'm, I'm practically through. So this is, this is, uh, you know, another look at these particular monetary policy rules, these alternative policy rules in more detail here. You know, zooming in on the on the details here. And in fact, um, you know, I didn't emphasize this here. Something happens in the normal interest rate here if you go to the DIAO alternative. Normal interest rates actually drop here. They rise. And there they drop. So you even get qualitatively different features in monetary policy. Output gap, you know, is more, now more persistent. You get a more persistent dynamics for the for the output gap, and um, because here the normal interest rate drops, right? The inflation is now the deflation is now not quite as strong, right? You might even say, well, wait a second, we're lowering normal interest rate. Why shouldn't we see? you know, inflation in the dollar, and I presume that can happen. But remember, we saw, you also get this, this, um, I don't know if to, I'm, I'm speaking too fast. Let me, let me, let me skip what I just wanted to say. Okay. Anyways, so that's, that's zooming in on this. Now we have some variations in the paper where you look at heterogeneous rigidity. And then, you know, if you have flexibility of price in the non-dollar sector that mitigates the output drop in that sector, um, you're getting, getting some subtle impact on the output dynamics here. Um, that is interesting to zoom in and stare on. Uh, again, this is all for the, for the benchmark Taylor rule for the AIAO. Uh, you know, obviously we could also go through this all, through the other ones as also, but then you have a plethora of cases. So we didn't want to you know, show this all. Um, you can also look at different sector shares. So here we having, you know, uh, different, uh, different rates of you know rigidity, price rigidity. So it's it's higher in the dollar sector than in the non-dollar sector. But now what happens if you have a larger non-dollar sector that induces a deeper overall recession? Uh, and that's you know in particular you know that's that's because you know if the dollar sector if you have this exchange rate shocks, it, it really means that the other so uh, sector you know moves quite a bit. So there are lots of results here that take some time to wrap your mind around. Anyways, overall, you know, the point is that when, when you have these firms pricing these other currencies, they are, there's a new shock coming up, namely the, these Carrick and Wallace, um, um, uh, you know, type uh, um, manually packed exchange rate shocks. And, and the central bank has to deal with that. They're introducing, you know, movements between these sectors and, and depending on how the central bank reacts to that. You're getting you're getting uh, different outcomes, and uh, and the model takes you through the paces. One can dig into this and try, seek to understand what happens. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Marty Oribe is the discussion. Marty, you have ten minutes. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> can you see the, the the slides? We can see it well. Yeah. Me... Okay. So. Um, Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be in this seminar and to discuss um, this uh, excellent paper by Carl. Um, so um, I'm glad that Carl, within the time limits um, that we had, um, uh, he gave um, a very um, focused and um, Presentations, but because my 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 discussion is going to be more general. Um, so, uh, what is um, the big thing of this paper? We see every day, you know, reading the news that these uh, digital currencies prices go up and down big time, and for many of us, it's just like an amusing. Uh, thing to follow uh, for people who have their money on them is, is more important. But we, at least I, have always wondered what are the 
do these price changes have any economic consequences besides this amusement uh, and, and uh, speculative um, uh, issues? And what uh, Harold and Kie do is to envision a world, um, an environment in which these swings in the price of digital, digital currencies do have uh, economic consequences. And that is a, a, um, an important insight. I think there by uh, resides the, the importance of, of this paper. Now, there, there are many, uh, when I was, when I read the, the, the title of the paper, um, I was thinking, well, how many ways, which different ways could this have real consequences? And, and I think they, they pick up the most important one, which is um, uh, a situation in which these currencies uh, start playing uh, the role of unit of account, um, in, in which case the issues of uh, nominal rigidities and so on start to play, play a role. So what exactly is in this paper? So there, there are three main ingredients. The first one is that these digit, digital currencies are, and, and the dollar, you put the, the dollar also are there, are, are perfectly substitutes in their role as means of payments, that is in their transaction role. Um, the second main ingredient is that they are units of account. That is to say they're each good or basket of good is, or groups of goods uh, are priced in different currencies, right? So some goods are priced in, Do in Bitcoins, others in Deutsche Coins, others in dollars. Uh, so there are different units of account in the economy, one per digital currency, say. Um, and the third main ingredient is um, sticky prices. That is the, the new Keynesian uh, component of the paper. Now, why, when you put these three ingredients together, uh, why do you get uh, a lot of action? Well, the first ingredient gives you in the terminacy of exchange rates. So um, following the, the, the Karakane Wallace uh, famous result, uh, these, these exchange rates are all going to be indeterminate. Uh, they're going to follow random walks. So this, these are like sectoral shocks that may be inconsequential unless you have items, ingredients two and three. Ingredients two by ingredients two, ingredient two, um, these prices are uh, set in different uh, uh, units of account. They are priced in different currencies. And by ingredient three, you have sticky prices. So these, these random walks in nominal exchange rates become, uh, at least in the short run, shocks to real exchange rates. That is to say, whenever you have an innovation, you know, random uh, uh, change in uh, expectations, um, what is a change in a nominal exchange rate becomes a change in a real exchange rate. That is to say, the change, for example, if, if a price of a coat is in, in bitcoins and the price of a, of, of a pair of shoes is in dollars, when the dollar Bitcoin exchange rate changes, the relative price of uh, a shoe uh, in terms of um, uh, whatever I said, the burger uh, changes. So these, these shocks begin to have real consequences. Um, so my general comments are essentially three. Uh, the first one uh, has to do with I have two about how likely is the Uli uh, here world um, going to be. And I think that uh, the history of um, uh, the monetary history of the world kind of suggests that there is a kind of a gravitational force towards uh, single currencies, at least. Uh, within each country and uh, in international transactions, that that uh, 
tendency is now called the dominant currency uh, hypothesis. And um, uh, for example, in the United States, we use only the dollar. Uh, it used to be more chaotic, uh, you know, before the creation of the of the Fed, and even earlier than that, before the creation of the U.S. National Bank, you used to have a bunch of different dollars ar ar around the country, uh, and that was kind of a nightmare. And it is a nightmare because, again, when these currencies are used as units of account and prices are sticky, um, any change in exchange rates is a change in relative prices. And living in a world in which relative prices are changing all the time is, is a nightmare. Uh, anybody who has lived in a high inflation economy with relative prices are changing all the time uh, knows how, how uh, difficult that is for shoppers and, and, um, and uh, also sellers. So I think there is a, a gravitational force towards a single currency that, that pushes us, I think, away from the uh, fully uh, here world, um, especially if uh, central banks start issuing their own digital currency, because if they start issuing their own digital currency, then you have a stable currency that has zero risk. Right now we have stable currency, but these are very risky stable currency, right? You write a contract with someone, you want to use your wallet the next day and the guy has run away. That, that is not gonna happen if you have, um, say, a, a e-dollar or a e-euro. Uh, the other uh, aspect of the Yulikie world that I would comment on is this assumption of a Hurricane Wallace environment, uh, because it requires that all currencies are highly substitutable, um, and they're clearly not now. You cannot go around your life using only bitcoins. Now the question is, is that going to be true in the future? And I think that that is going to be unlikely. Uh, to begin with, I think we are going to continue to pay our taxes in dollars. Um, uh, and um, so that by itself uh, creates a big source of non sustainability to pay 35% of our income in, in taxes. Uh, but it's very unlikely that the problem is that this Karakin Wallace it relies on a knife edge uh, condition, which is that they are perfectly substitutable. Once you move away for perfect substitutability, you can have big swings in exchange rate, but those big swings in exchange rate are not going to be non fundamental. They are going to be fundamental. Uh, the the non fundamental source of um, aggregate uncertainty goes away. So my suggestion would be to maybe for, for the next paper, it would be to explore the, the issue of uh, non substitutability across currencies, you know, do away with the Karakane Wallace in the terminacy and go to the case of imperfect substitutability. And there is a, a reason uh, for that, which is something that Harold didn't touch upon, but his paper explains very, very well, which is that um, in his model, uh, or in their model, I, I would say, there are two authors here, if you have aggregate shocks, like preference, technology shocks, etc., cetera, um, the, the real effects of those shocks is the same as in, in their model, is the same as in, the, in, in an economy with a single currency. Now, if you have imperfect substitutability, uh, to the extent that these shocks generate changes in exchange rates, they are going to have uh, aggregate shocks, fundamental aggregate shocks, like preference and technology, are going to have sectorial effects. And those sectorial effects can, have, uh, can, have the, can lead to the result that aggregate shocks in the ulic model have different effects than in the uh, standard one currency uh, model. So I think this, this aspect of their model is something that is kind of completely unexplored right now. And I think it gives room for a, for a new paper, which I think is gonna be uh, also easier for people to, to kind of digest because of the three things 
perhaps the most controversial is the perfect subjectability. And in this model that I'm suggesting here is uh, I'm doing away with that. Okay, so I'm out of time. So let me uh, conclude. Uh, this paper, uh, as I said at the beginning, I, I am ending right basically where I started, uh, gives an answer to this question that we all have. Um, are these tantrums of Elon Musk just an amusement park uh, that we read in the news and we laugh for five minutes and that's it? Or do they have uh, real consequences? And this paper gives a very serious, very rigorous, um, uh, provides a very rigorous environment in which these shocks uh, have real consequences. So I think it's a paper that um, has a very important uh, insight. And then from, from the more practical point of view, um, if you are familiar with the standard engine model, this paper is really a walk in the park. I mean, the authors make it a walk in the park. In, in principle, it's a very complicated model because it has multiple sectors, multiple currencies, in, uh, it's heterogeneous stickiness and so on. But the authors write in such a way that it's very, very, very easy to read. So um, I think it's a paper that is uh, highly recommended to read if you are interested in this, uh, in this literature. Okay, I'm gonna stop here. Let me see if I can uh, unshare my screen. There. Yeah. Thanks, Harold, do you wanna respond right away? And then we go to questions by the audience. Yeah, sounds good. So let me start. Maybe Taoyun would also want to add something. So thank you. Thank you, Martin. That, what, that's an awesome and, and very friendly discussion. Uh, truly appreciate it. Um, I mean, you mentioned many things. Let me let me maybe, um, you know, put my finger on two. So one is the, the dominant currency paradigm. And isn't there some natural tendency in a country to just use a single currency because dealing with two currencies, you know, is a bit of a mess. And you know these network effects, the dominant currency paradigm, and so forth. And you know maybe that's the dollar internationally in any particular given country. Maybe the national currency. I'm sympathetic with that argument, and I agree that maybe the words that we have in this paper don't come to pass. The only question is, are, are we going to be sure, right? And the reason that perhaps I'm less sure is, you know, um, think about think about smart contracts, for example, right? I mean, so purely, I mean, one version of these network effect is an argument that, that, that I've seen with Bewley many, many years ago, right? If one firm prices in currency A, you also want to pre-price in currency A because, you know, there are sort of cross effects. So if Ethereum, for example, with Ethereum, you get these smart contracts, maybe decentralized finance that's running on these decentralized blockchains and, and these cryptocurrency blockchains emerge really as a powerful force. And then once you have this decentralized contracts there, wouldn't it then be natural to start paying your workers in Ethereum, right? Or if, if there's DM1, maybe there's going to be DM2 that's going to be in an, in an, with an inter, backbone international portfolio and it's sitting on everybody's app and maybe it's just going to be easier if you go and pay for it and knowing how much you have for people conceptually to pay to pay occasionally in that currency, maybe for younger people and for older people to compare. To, so, so all I'm saying is it's possible that the dominant currency paradigm will rule out the worries that we have here, but we should be worried about it at least a little bit, right? We can afford that we're devoting some research into it and it, 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 it may, uh, you know, maybe the worry is founded in the end and then we better be prepared. The other question is about the exchange rates and imperfect substitutability. And that's a great suggestion as we revise the paper, we should think about whether imperfect substitutability makes our results go away. I suspect not, but I confess that I haven't sort of fully thought that through. I think the main thing that I want to answer though here is that we do see exchange rates between currencies fluctuating a lot, I mean, between official currencies. We're seeing a lot of nominal exchange of fluctuations immediately translating into real uh, fluctuations. And there are thousands of papers written trying to understand where these fluctuations are coming from. And if I understand my international finance colleagues well, you know, it's, it's just super hard to say, you know, why suddenly the dollar appreciates and why it depreciates. I mean, so, you know, we know that dollars and euros aren't perfect substitutes, yet, yet there are enormous exchange fluctuations that are really, really hard to pin down to fundamentals. And now maybe, so, so I think, so I think the problem doesn't go away. The question is just, uh, does it require some other change in the model if imperfect substitutability would already 
invalidate the Carrigan uh, Wallace um, manually peg type chalk, and and that that's just something that we have to think through. I think it's an excellent suggestion. Thank you. Thanks for pointing that out. Taoyun, okay. do you want to add something? Maybe I don't know. Uh, no, but thanks, uh, thanks, Martin, for the very excellent comments. Okay. Yes. So um, we already had a, a couple of, of questions that, that in the Q and A uh, and that, that have been answered on the go. Maybe we can come back to them later. For now, let's collect a couple of questions by the panelists. Um, actually, let me pose one very quickly and then go to Charles and then go to Katrin. Um, so, so I just wanted to, to very briefly uh, add a clarification question. What exactly is the sort of the, the nature of the, sort of the, the exchange rate process for the digital currency that you have in mind? And sort of how does it relate to, you know, what, what cryptocurrencies do, like, uh, you know, be in fixed supply or have a predetermined supply schedule? It, it, just to tie that better to, to digital currencies, which I, I re recommend not taking out of the title, but actually taking more seriously in terms of the microeconomics of this. Um, just, just a quick clarification. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I mean, again, it's, it's important to emphasize that this paper here is strictly about the unit of account portion, right? I mean, some of these questions that arise are about the medium of exchange, right? I mean, so in our world, for example, it could be the case that all the transactions are done in dollar, nonetheless, half of the firm's price in Bitcoin or the other way around. So one has to be, one has, you know, so... so um, so that's a distinction that I want to draw. Now, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Once one goes indeed to the liquidity side, I mean, again, the money stock in the new Keynesian models and, you know, it, it sort of treated as an afterthought in much of that literature, right? Woodford wrote a couple of chapters and ever since, you know, it's kind of ditched in 90, 95% of that literature. And so, so we're in that company, if you like. Uh, but it's a fair question. And how does it work? And here maybe, you know, a quick answer might be to point to this paper that I wrote with Linda on some simple Bitcoin economics, where there's a central bank that worries about the price level. And then there's a cryptocurrency and who knows how the supply is determined. Maybe on demand, that would be DM. Maybe it's just a fixed supply that grows over time at a fixed rate like Bitcoin or maybe some other pattern. But the central bank has to then basically un undo the shocks that that does to the price, uh, to the price level, right? So, for, I mean, I, just referring to that result that I had my paper with Linda, if suddenly more cryptocurrencies come in and you get a quantity theory equation and the central bank is worried about keeping the price level constant, what it has to do is take dollar out, right? And, and so there are these monetary policy side consequences of these fluctuating supplies and cryptocurrencies. But, but again, it, it, as in all these new Keynesian models, all this, you know, money stock issues are, are, are sort of, afterthoughts once you know the normal interest rate policy of the central bank and and that's what we do here as well that, that probably doesn't fully answer the question but that was maybe a start i guess you're right maybe you should take the digital a little bit more seriously in the paper i want to push that a little further because it seems to me like you really do say that um the, uh, the unit of account is really the central can you hear charles i can't hear him well am i not clear now hold a second let me try it uh, making it louder. Hold on. No, I'm as high as I'm as high a level as I can be. Can, I mean, hmm. oh. Try to get closer to your mic. Maybe. Uh, is this better? Yeah. yeah. We can hear you though. Okay. Let me take a less sexy uh, interpretation. This is a story about Brazil or a high inflation country in the old days where part of the uh, economy is tagged to dollar prices and part of it is tagged to domestic prices. Um, no worry about the money, but, but that's not part of your story anyway. It's worrying about two different segments of units of accounts and how should monetary theory be done in such a world? What have I missed? Oh, you're absolutely right. So, I mean, that's why I also mentioned initially that you could take the word digital out, right? It's, it's um, I, I, you know, it took me a while to understand what dollarization means. Sometimes it means literally the dollar circulating as piece of paper, as medium of, um, uh, you know, as a as medium of transaction. But, um, 
But you're right that many times when you talk dollarization, it's just about pricing. You know, you might lose your local currency to make the actual payment. You know, and I heard that during Turkey, during the high inflation episodes, you know, rental contracts and, and so forth, expensive goods were all priced in dollars. But when you had to actually pay, you, you transact the Turkish lira. So, so yeah, it's, it's, that, um, it's that world, if you like, right? And in the central bank in that world, you know, how does it worry about the, about the sector that's pricing in dollar in that case? What we what the, the reason that we think this, but this so we know this phenomenon right it has been there it has been bedeviling countries what we argue is that this may be an issue that now arises for countries with our type inflation all of that because digital currencies are just so easy to come by and introduce and having all their versions and offer their own attractions right especially into young people that want to play with all these smart contracts and all the possibilities so 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 yeah you could say let's just let's just take that literature and apply it to that situation um, we are not aware but there may be papers that that do new keynes analysis on the brazilian economy uh, of the type that you described but our analysis applies there as well absolutely Catherine, you're next. Yeah, thanks. So I would also side with Raphael and arguing for keeping the digital. And my argument would be, if you think of the Brunnermeyer, um, uh, James Lando paper, so they have these bundling of information services and, and digital currencies, which means that, uh, say, if you purchase something online on Facebook or Facebook tokens or whatever, so I think that was the worry when uh, Libra was launched, and so now it will be a different model, but I think that was the model that shook up uh, central banks, that you have certain environment where you purchase things with certain currencies. So I think uh, it could be relevant even without hyperinflation. But then I think you would ask, have to ask yourself as a central bank, um, as you do, which, which price index are you stabilizing? And aren't you stabilizing something that is also relevant for country outside your jurisdiction. So if you go for these uh, crypto stabilization rule, is it really something that's only interfering with you? So I think in the end, um, there are many more questions coming up than what you answer in your model. I think adoption is one question. And then maybe in a two country world, these um, spillbacks and these things. So I know that's far beyond uh, of your model, but it may be more interesting in looking at smaller number of currencies and all these interactions between say two currencies in, in an economy. So I think you should keep the digital. So that's the upshot. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Catherine. That's, that's super nice. And, and, and you're raising really important points here, right? So one could extend this to an international world where maybe the cryptocurrencies also use in other countries. So then if you stabilize aggregate inflation would have impact on the other countries because of that, right? That's an issue. And I fully agree with what you said. And I think we should emphasize this more, right? It used to be that the currency competition was about relative inflation rates, right? In an high inflation country, you wanted to use a low inflation currency. But that's, but now with the cryptocurrencies, we have another dimension of, of competition, you know, the, the kinds of things you can do with a currency. Can you write smart contracts on it? How easy is it to transact? How easy it is it is it to you know, to do all kinds of things. How, you know, do you have an app that can be used with that, right? And so there, there are, so there are additional dimensions that now come with currency competition that that I think we need to pay attention to, and and that's I think where you're completely right. I think the Libra, you know, made got central banks to sweat, and we'll see where that's where this is uh, going. Thanks. So. Um... It's four, uh, before six, we, we, we discussed before that we could go a bit over time. Obviously, whoever has to leave, uh, thanks a lot for attending. Um, we, we, we actually, we had a very nice set of questions in the Q&A that Taujin has been answering. Let me, before coming back to the panelists, take two because they're quite of related and read them out to you. So um, one is, have you tried endogenous choice of unit of account? How would re your results change? And the other one is, what if the if the other cur currency is a CBDC without a specific policy rule using the same unit of account, however, with a convenience yield that instills markets to price them, them differently? So, um, right, so, so the, and, and then there were also other questions related to sort of the microeconomics of how firms choose 
where how they they choose the their their, their how how you choose the, the invoicing currency and that certainly goes back to to Martin's comments. So maybe we yeah, so let me let me jump with this and tell you by any you know anytime you want to jump in, you know I mean please you know I I shouldn't just uh, you know avoid that you talk so that would be terrible. Let me let me maybe talk about the first one about the currency endogenous currency choice. So we do have a section in the paper that addresses this, and it's it's uh, you know where the firms have some individual preference that's random between pricing one currency or the other. But then also because of the stickiness that that uh, there's a certain value, you know, if it's less sticky, maybe it's uh, it's better to price in that currency, or maybe it's more valuable, right? Now there's, there's that section actually, you know, we, we discovered an issue recently that needs to be addressed, and also in the interest of time, I didn't have time to present that here, but but yeah, it's absolutely an interesting issue to think about and. Um, Maybe also going. I mean, we, you know, the network effect is something that would be interesting to study, but we don't have that in the paper at all, even this in this currency choice issue. So it's just an individual choice, and you may have a preference for one or the other. Um, the second question, I must confess, I didn't fully follow. So this is that if the currency is a CBDC versus cash, is that the issue? I mean, it could be another CBDC, of course, right? So if if the e e dollar gets used for for pricing in Europe, right? I mean, our model would very much apply, but maybe I misunderstood the question. Tell you maybe, I mean, again, tell you maybe you want to add something to that or to any of the other ones. Yeah, but by, my understanding is that um, the convenience you will just remove the randomness in the exchange rate because they are just imperfect substitute. There are still some subtle difference because they are the same currency, but they are utilizing different payment channels. So, that will remove some of the randomness in the exchange rate in our paper. So, yeah. Now, perhaps different convenient yields would, would introduce a trend in exchange rates, I would imagine, right? And um, maybe that's the that's solution, but we haven't fully looked at that. Okay, thanks. So, actually, I see a raised hand by, by Chris Cameron, an attendant, but I, I don't think you can actually unmute yourself. So maybe you posted your question in the chat, in the, or you can. Chris, can I hear you now? Yes, can you hear me? Ah, oh, yeah. yeah, we can hear you, actually. Uh, fantastic, yeah. So I'm actually what passes for an economist over at MakerDAO. We issue the fourth largest stable coin by market cap. And I just wanted to chime in and say that a lot of this talk about future, um, we actually have hundreds of millions of dollars of financing already being invoiced in at least our stable coin and probably others. Uh, so I want to say thank you so much for uh, starting this line of research, and it, it touches on a lot of subjects that I uh, lose sleep over at night about uh, fixed exchange rates uh, changing suddenly. Uh, and also just wanted to say if you or anyone else uh, needs help finding data on how this is happening right now, uh, please feel free to reach out. Oh, that's fantastic. I jump on that immediately. Chris, can you send me an email to huhlig at uchicago.edu? I would I would love to be in contact about this. I mean, this is sure. Thank you so I, much. Yeah, sure. And I'll leave my email in the chat for anybody else that, that is interested. Okay, thanks. Next is Rod. Rod Garrett. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Harold. Great presentation. Uh, I was just going to jump on. I guess this bandwagon of encouraging you to emphasize the digital uh, aspect because I think this is uh, going to be really important, as you say. And what my question relates to is, is or I guess it's more of a suggestion, is I'm thinking about the fact that a lot of the forms of uh, currencies might be in the form of stable coins. And so they are therefore subject to risks associated with improper backing, um, you know, run risk and that sort of thing. And so I'm wondering if, if, if that sort of shock would feed in differently than the sort of conventional type of exchange rate fluctuations that you're thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think about, uh, I mean, um, you know, let's let's say we think about a stable coin that has a one percent chance of going belly up, and we have certainly seen this in particular for the algorithmic stable coins, right? And uh, some of the other ones. I mean, who knows how they're backed? I don't want to get into all the legal battles there that are out there. But yeah, imagine imagine you have a stable coin that's you know not fully cleanly accounting supervised to just uh, put it in those terms right then if you buy these stable coins actually they shouldn't be stable right they should be appreciating in value because there's a risk that suddenly they go down right 
and then on average the exchange rate should be stable that's true in expectation but you would weigh you know the gradual appreciation with a drastic depreciation and when the stable coin if that stable coin is used as pricing for large parts of the economy then I, I guess I wouldn't be worried much about the gradual appreciation, which is also a shock here, right? I mean, you would be surprised that it didn't go belly up, right? But that surprise happens most of the time. Sometimes it does go belly up and that would wreak havoc in this world, right? If it's used for pricing for large parts of the economy, that would wreak havoc and, and obviously, you know, call the central bank uh, into action immediately, right? So that could be one source of the shock. Um, and maybe that that says that, um, in order to avoid the real impact of that, you know, it's, it's, especially for the large stable coins such as DM, you should be extra careful in, in making sure that they're really stable, right, to avoid that. Yeah, excellent question, thanks. Okay, many thanks. I, at the moment, I don't see a raised hand and all the Q&As have been answered, but we're already in overtime. So again, I wanna thank, I wanna thank you know, uh, Harold and, and Tajin, I want to thank Martin, the organizers, and also all the panelists and the audience. Uh, great talk, great discussion. Thanks a lot. And um, now I'm going to pass it back to uh, Jonathan, who yep. will announce the next uh, seminar of this series. Thank you again to Rafael, Harold, and Martin, as well as all of you for participating today. Uh, you'll be able to find the slides and the link to the YouTube video on our website, cbndc.net. Uh, we'll now take a summer break and hope you will join us again on September 24th when the Federal Reserve Board will host our next session. Um, so I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and have a good weekend. Bye bye.